it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Lobel. Dr. Lobel is an Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of Calgary and the Canada Research Chair in Pediatric Imaging. She leads the Child, Brain and Mental Health Program at the Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute and the Hotchkiss Brain Institute. Dr. Lobel received her PhD in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Alberta and completed postdoctoral training in Neurology and Pediatrics at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research uses MRI to study how brain structure and function function change with age in typical children and those with neurodevelopmental disorders, including fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and learning disabilities. She also examines how brain structure and function are related to cognitive, behavioral, and environmental factors, including the prenatal environment. So welcome, Dr. LaBelle. So I'm going to talk to you today about how some aspects of the prenatal environment are related to structural and functional brain development in kids. So really my entire research program focuses around brain structure and function use, measured using MRI. So we use a variety of different techniques in the lab to measure kids' brains. And really what I'm interested in is how these brains change over time. So not just a snapshot of where they are, but that's that's useful as well, but really how they grow and how they change and how that's related to all sorts of other variables. But today we're gonna to talk about the prenatal environment. And so some of the things that can influence brain structure and function in kids from the prenatal environment are things like maternal depression and anxiety. So under an umbrella perhaps of maternal stress, also exposure to drugs, we heard a lot about cannabis yesterday, um, and exposure to alcohol, among other things, of course. And these influence not just brain structure when kids are born, but actually they also influence how the brain grows over time. Okay. And I think it's important too, to think about some perhaps more positive influences of the prenatal environment and how those can impact brain structure and function. So things like, physical activity, social support, and sleep can also affect kids' brains and how their brains grow. So I'm gonna to touch briefly on some of those today as well. And then we've heard a lot over the last couple of days about postnatal environment as well. And uh, what is so important, I think, is this interaction between prenatal and postnatal environment, particularly in humans, where we can't control it and we know everyone's exposed to various aspects in both prenatal and postnatal life. So I'm going to just briefly touch on this as well. Okay, so I'm going to start with a little bit of information on typical brain development. Then we're going to talk about prenatal alcohol exposure and how that's associated with brain outcomes in kids. And then in the last part, I'm going to talk about prenatal psychological distress and how that's related to child brain outcomes. And I'm going to try to link this to mental health and potential moderating factors along the way as well. So structural brain development proceeds really rapidly in infancy. And you can see this with the naked eye. So these are just infant brain atlases from a newborn, a one-year-old and a two-year-old. And you can see that the brain is growing quite a bit. You can also see that the contrast shifts here and that's because of myelination that's ongoing in the brain over that first couple of years of life. So really evident changes in those first couple of years we can also see changes a little bit later, but still in early childhood. So this is the same child at two years and four years of age. We can see a little bit of brain growth there, but really substantial growth. If you focus in on the white matter, you can see it's getting quite a bit bigger between two and four years old. When we get a little bit later in childhood, this is the same one at eight and 12, it's less apparent to the naked eye, but we know there's still quite a bit of brain development ongoing. So it's helpful to quantify this, of course, and this is just a very um, simple measure of total brain volume, total white matter volume and total brain matter volume here in the older kids, total white matter volume here in the younger kids. So we see massive increases in white matter volume over this early childhood period, about doubling of white matter volume, but we see continued increases in white matter through adolescence and into early adulthood paired with decreasing gray matter volume. So this is important, I think, to understand the context of the findings I'm gonna talk about a bit later. 
We can also look at some more specific measures of brain structure that we can get from diffusion imaging. So here we've got fractional anisotropy or FA and mean diffusivity or MD, which are both measures of white matter microstructure. And both of these change considerably over childhood. Generally, we see increases of fractional anisotropy and we see decreases of mean diffusivity. And I'm going to show a lot of these plots. So just to orient you to these scatter plots, every little gray dot in this image is one individual MRI scan from one child. The blue and the red lines are the best fit lines for an individual child who's come back multiple times in a longitudinal study. And then the darker, thicker, or the, sorry, the thicker black line is the overall best fit curve across all of the data. <clears throat> the final sort of important point I want to make about brain development across childhood is that it's regionally varying. So not er every area of the brain develops at the same rate. And, you know, if we look at early childhood here, we tend to see three patterns of brain development in the microstructure. We see this one pattern of relatively slow development, but high initial values of fractional anisotropy. These tracts are involved in things like motor function and inner hemispheric communication. And these are our tracts that have developed quite a bit over the first couple of years of life and are, are probably towards the end of their development. We see another group of white matter tracts that has, again, relatively slow development, but they start at quite a bit lower values than these other ones. You can see 0.36 versus 0.52. And these are tracts that we know are gonna develop for a very long time into the 20s. And so these are sort of the slow and steady tracts and we're seeing the more early phases of their development. And then there's another group of white matter connections that's undergoing relatively rapid development across this age range. And these are tracts involved in things like language that we know is really going through a large period or a fast period of development in those early years. We also see regional variation when we look at other metrics. This is cortical thickness, for example, and you can see different rates of change in different parts of the cortex. So we see this nonlinear development, we see regional variation, and we also see substantial individual differences. If you look, for example, at five-year-olds here, you see almost as much variation across five-year-olds as we see between a typical two-year-old and a typical seven-year-old. So really substantial individual variation, and these are all typically developing kids. But when we start to look at particular children themselves, we see less variation. So these lines that are below the curve tend to stay below the curve, and kids that are above the curve tend to stay below, above the curve, generally following the same sort of pattern of development. We can look at a couple of specific examples here. These are individual scans. So you can see a little bit of variation over time, but on average, this person that started above stays above, and this person that started below stays below. So I really think this highlights the importance of looking longitudinally, right? I think we can learn a lot about these trajectories and, and particularly if trajectories start to drop off of the, the norm, more so than we can learn from individual data points. Okay, so with that kind of foundation of typical brain development in mind, now I wanna spend some time talking about prenatal alcohol exposure. And this is associated with a variety of cognitive and behavioral challenges in kids, but also in adults as well. Some of the notable domains that are affected are executive function, sensory motor function, and mental health, with people with PAE experiencing difficulties in often several of these domains. Some individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure have facial dysmorphology, but not all of them. And we know there are widespread brain alterations. The neurodevelopmental disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or FASD. And this is way more common than most people realize. In Canada, it's estimated at about 4%. So two and a half times as common as autism. And in the US, they give a range of two to 5%, but really a common disorder that's, I think, dramatically understudied. So 
PAE has pretty widespread effects on brain structure and it affects different aspects of brain structure as well. We see widespread reductions of brain volume in children with prenatal alcohol exposure. We see smaller deep gray matter volumes, we see thinner cortex, we see smaller overall brain volumes and, and white matter as well. So really widespread and that's robust across different ages. When it comes to diffusion parameters, we see generally lower FA and higher MD in kids with PAE. And if you think back to those typical development, this is consistent with a less mature pattern of brain structure. This is a DTI study we did ages ago, but all of the tracts in blue and red and yellow had abnormalities in the group with FASD and the green tracts didn't. So you can see it's really widespread across areas of the brain. And these are pretty robust findings across studies. Importantly, we also Well, hello, everybody. Uh, forget the, oh, there you are. Okay. My computer dropped me. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, can you see me again? See you, uh, and we got your slide. There we go. Okay, great. Okay, and did I drop off before I got to this slide, or like, did you miss a, a while? <laughs> I think uh, around the beginning of the slide is when we. Okay. When, we, when you dropped off. Um, Okay, does this look familiar? Maybe I'll just recap this and then I'll go in. Okay, so we see these widespread reductions in brain volume and widespread differences in diffusion parameters in kids and uh, youth and young adults with prenatal alcohol exposure. But importantly, we also see differences in brain development. Okay, so here we're looking at a group of kids with prenatal alcohol exposure, individual lines in blue here and the best fit line in the, the darker blue versus kids without prenatal alcohol exposure in black. Okay, so in gray here and then black for the overall line. And these are areas of the brain that had significant differences in trajectories of brain gray matter volume. So what I think it's important to notice here is, is first they're different, but it's the, the trajectories in the unexposed kids are more dynamic. They go up and then they go down. They're more curved than the lines in the prenatal alcohol exposure group, really suggesting that we're seeing perhaps some differences in brain plasticity here, where the control brains are developing um, faster and undergoing more changes, and the brains of the kids with prenatal alcohol exposure are changing a bit more slowly. And this has really important implications, of course, for these kids' learning and behavior, and may help to explain some of the deficits that we see. So in my lab, we're sort of taking this work now in a couple of different directions. One is looking at the brain from more of a whole brain network type of approach. And then secondly, trying to look at younger kids because most of the studies have been done in kids about eight or older. So one way of looking at the brain is, as I said, to take a, a kind of a network approach. And so this is where you take brain regions, you look at connectivity between each pair of regions, and then you can map out a connectome for the brain. And we can measure different parameters, for example, on this connectome, things like efficiency or path length, which would be the, the number of steps you have to take to get from one region to another along connections. So we've done this in a group of older children and youth with prenatal alcohol exposure. And what we see looking at the structural connectome is um, just overall less efficiency in the brains of the kids with prenatal alcohol exposure and a longer shortest path length. So these brains unsurprisingly, but don't seem to be functioning quite as efficiently as the brains of kids without prenatal alcohol exposure. We find something pretty similar when we look at connectivity between and within structural networks. So you can divide the brain into these sort of classic networks like a visual network, sensory motor, attention networks. And we did this and we looked at structural connectivity between and within them. And again, we see this widespread reduced connectivity 
in these kids with prenatal alcohol exposure, particularly notable for the sensory motor network here. We can look at functional brain development as well. And here we did so for the attention networks in the brain divided into the executive control attention network and the orienting network. And the black nodes are part of both networks. So this is kids with PDE on the top and kids who are typically developing unexposed kids on the bottom. This is just the pattern of connections. And so the pattern of connections is pretty similar between the two, but you'll note a couple of areas, particularly these long range connections that are more negative in the prenatal alcohol exposure group. And this is, this is evident as well when we look at significant differences between the groups. So the blue lines represent reduced connectivity <laughs> excuse me, in the PAE group relative to controls. And we see some areas that are sort of more long range connections being affected with this reduced connectivity. And some of the more local connections are actually strengthened in the PAE group. So sort of this pattern where we see widespread reduced structural connectivity. But when we look at functional connectivity, we see almost strengthened connectivity within networks, but reduced connectivity between networks. And I think all of this is sort of reflecting that efficiency idea where these brains are a little bit less efficient at processing and are perhaps trying to compensate for some of that with increased functional connectivity within systems. So we also wanted to look at younger children with prenatal alcohol exposure. And this is a really important age range because most of these kids aren't old enough yet to get an assessment for a diagnosis of FASD. In Alberta, for example, assessments typically don't take place until kids are seven or eight years old. And it's also a really important time of brain development and behavior and cognitive development. So this early childhood period is when many of the disorders, or sorry, many of the problems we see associated with prenatal alcohol exposure typically emerge the behavior and cognitive difficulties. So we scanned a group of young children with prenatal alcohol exposure. Most of them were able to come in twice for longitudinal data. And we compare these to our typically developing group of controls, which is the data I showed you at the beginning for that normal brain development. And what we saw when we looked at white matter in this group of young children with PAE is higher FA and lower mean diffusivity in the kids with prenatal alcohol exposure. Okay, so this is actually opposite to what we expected to find and it's opposite to what basically all of the studies before had seen in older kids um, with the exception of the fornix where we did see lower, lower FA. And then here is the MD graph. So we're seeing lower mean diffusivity in the children with PE. So this suggests actually a more mature pattern of brain structure in these kids with PAE, which as I mentioned, really contrasts the results that we ourselves had seen and that other studies had seen in older children with PAE. And now this is where I think that longitudinal data gets to be so important. Okay, so many of these kids had to come back for a second scan. So we were able to look at longitudinal data here to help try to understand what's going on. So here we have the group with prenatal alcohol exposure in purple and the group without alcohol exposure, the controls in blue. And I think this longitudinal data really nicely illustrates what we're seeing here, which is actually faster development in the controls than in the group with PAE. Okay, so the group with PA has slower brain development here. And it helps connect these results at younger ages where we see lower mean diffusivity in the PAE group and results at older ages, which you can sort of imagine if you extend these lines out where you would find higher mean diffusivity in the PAE group. Okay, so these lines cross anywhere from about six to eight years old, depending on the brain region. So again, we're seeing that regional variation but really showing that there's slower brain development in this PAE group. And this is along the lines of what I showed you before with gray matter volume, where we see less dynamic trajectories in the PAE group. Really, I think, reflecting less brain plasticity 
So brains are developing at a slower rate, um, which has implications for learning and behavior. And this is true both of white matter and of gray matter in these kids with prenatal alcohol exposure. <clears throat> So premature development is something you know we've already heard over the last few days and any of you familiar with the early adversity literature would be familiar with this as well. Although it's typically associated with postnatal early adversity. So for example, early adversity in the form of postnatal threats is associated with accelerated DNA methylation and advanced puberty. So here a number of threat experiences people had had in childhood was associated with um, a higher tanner stage for puberty. And traumatic stressful events in childhood are also associated with faster brain maturation. So for example, here in the solid triangles are the males and females with more stressful experiences in childhood. And they have a more adult-like brain than the kids without those threat exposures. So I think what we're seeing in these kids with PAE is sort of consistent with this premature development we see more generally in the early adversary, adversity literature. And it may be that it's a bit more prominent in these young kids that we're looking at. But of course it's important, really important to consider these postnatal experiences as well. Things prenatal and postnatal exposures do not happen generally in isolation in humans. Um, they very, very often co-occur, but typically they're studied separately. And, you know, I'm guilty of this as well, but we tend to take a population with and without prenatal alcohol exposure, compare them and attribute the results to the alcohol exposure, sometimes without even asking about postnatal experiences or vice versa. The, the postnatal adversity literature doesn't ask about prenatal exposures, even though we know that many of those kids were likely exposed as well. So we took the sample in our lab and we really scoured every piece of information we could get our hands on to characterize the exposures that these kids have experienced. Okay, so everyone that I'm talking about in this sample had prenatal alcohol exposure. Okay, that's the big gray circle. But out of these kids, there were 77 of them, 96% of them were also prenatally exposed to another substance. Okay, so tobacco, cannabis, other forms of drugs. So almost all of them have a different substance exposure on top of the alcohol. 87% of them, so they, again, still a large majority, had exposures to other prenatal stresses. And here what I mean is things like the lack of prenatal care, um, a mother who was experienced, experiencing domestic violence or who didn't have stable housing. Then we also looked at postnatal um, adversity. And so here we categorized it into threats. So this is things like abuse or witnessing violence in the home. That was about a third of the kids in the study. And postnatal deprivation. So, so things like neglect or a lack of stable food or stable housing or a lack of access to food, for example. So really you know, widespread co-occurring other adversities. So 99% of our sample had exposure to some other form of prenatal stress, whether it was substance abuse or prenatal stress. And 70% of them had at least one type of postnatal exposure. So these are really important to consider, I think, when we're talking about the effects of PAE. And so we're trying to separate this a little bit in our sample as, as best we can. So we had 31 children and youth with prenatal alcohol exposure, and we subdivided these into a group of kids that had no postnatal exposure, so PAE minus, and a group of kids that had postnatal exposures, so PAE plus. And we compared these with 31 age and gender matched typical controls that also had the same brain data. We looked at the volumes of limbic and prefrontal structures, and we looked at a parent assessment of behavior and mental health in these kids. Okay, and we compared these among these three groups. So first, <clears throat> excuse me, we see that there are differences in externalizing behavior among these groups. So this is things like aggression and hyperactivity. And here, both of the exposure groups, both the PAE minus and the PAE plus, had higher externalizing scores than controls. This means they have worse behavior, more behavior problems than our controls. 
So it's interesting because I think it indicates first that the alcohol exposure itself is likely associated with the behavior problems that we see. There was no difference between the PAE minus and the PAE plus group, although there is, um, there was a higher mean score in the PAE plus group and they were more significantly different from the controls. So suggesting that there's definitely a role of PAE in the behavior problems that we see that maybe is moderated by the postnatal exposure. Then we looked at brain structure <clears throat> in these kids. And we saw here, again, we saw differences based on alcohol exposure, but we saw more differences in the PAE minus group. So the group with prenatal, but not postnatal exposure had smaller volumes and lower FA in a number of different brain regions than our controls, the controls are in red. But the PAE plus group, so prenatal alcohol exposure and postnatal exposure looked like controls in a lot of the brain areas that we examined. And in fact, were significantly different from the PAE minus group in some of the areas we looked at. So we're seeing sort of some of these expected results, lower volumes, lower FA. This is a group of slightly older kids and adolescents, but some unexpected results with the PAE plus group. And I think a couple of important things to point out. One is that we know because of the behavior scores that this isn't adaptive, okay? It's not that these kids with pre and postnatal adversity are doing better in terms of function. They're actually doing worse. But we do see these brains that look kind of similar to controls. Second thing is that in this type of work, it's sometimes very hard to get an accurate characterization of exactly how much alcohol exposure there was. So there could be differences between these two groups in terms of the amount of alcohol exposure. They're all exposed to alcohol, but sometimes it's just hard to quantify the exact amount. But I think also it comes back to this idea of brain development. And unfortunately, we don't have longitudinal data in these kids, but we can draw on sort of some of our other work and some of what we know from the literature. So we know um, in the younger kids that these kids with PAE had higher FA at younger ages. We know from the early adversity literature that early adversity can cause premature brain development. And so I think we might be seeing some weird sort of crossover effect here because we know that um, the controls are likely to go on to develop a bit later. Okay, so if we're seeing the controls just at a phase of development where they started lower, but now they're gonna get higher, and we're looking at them here, this is the type of relationship we would see. And this is very weakly supported, but it's supported by our data. We just don't have enough data points to properly assess this yet. But it also fits with the data we have in younger kids where we see this faster development in controls and slower development in the kids with prenatal alcohol exposure. So I think, again, this comes down to the idea of, of reduced plasticity in the group with PAE and perhaps a reduced window of plasticity as well. Um, but it is really important to keep in mind with these interpretations that timing, type, and duration, both of prenatal exposure and of postnatal adversity matter. So finally, I wanna link this to some of the behavior and mental health that we see. And across a number of different studies now, we see a similar pattern. So this, for example, is volume of part of the anterior cingulate cortex versus externalizing problems. And in controls in purple here, we see that larger cingulate volumes are associated with fewer behavior problems in the PAE group, and I apologize if that's difficult to see, we see no significant relationship. We see this again in our younger kids where we see lower mean diffusivity, so a more mature brain structure associated with less behavior problems, but in the PAE group, we see the opposite relationship. And we see this again in that PAE plus and minus groups that I showed you in controls, higher FA associated with fewer problems, but the opposite in the alcohol exposure groups, okay? So not only are we seeing brain differences and more mental health problems associated with PAE, but we also see a disrupted relationship between mental health and brain, okay? So PAE really is changing the brain, but it's also changing this relationship with mental health. Okay, with the last um, few minutes of my talk, I wanna 
switch gears here a little bit and talk about a different type of prenatal exposure. In this case, prenatal psychological distress. And by this, I mean depression and anxiety symptoms. And clinical levels of depression and anxiety affect probably over 20% of pregnant individuals during normal, normal times. So very common. And these are associated with increased behavior problems in kids, as well as later mental health, mental health risks in those kids themselves. And they're also associated with brain alterations. So for example, this is a study we did a few years ago, where we looked at depression symptoms during pregnancy. In this case, I'm talking about the second trimester. And we found that they were associated with thinner cortex, in the right frontal and temporal lobes. Okay? So higher symptoms of depression in pregnancy were associated with thinner cortex in the kids. And then we also looked at the white matter that connects to these cortical areas. And we saw similar patterns where higher depression symptoms were associated with lower diffusivity. And so again, you can kind of connect this back to some of that PAE work I showed in the young kids where we're seeing almost a more mature pattern of brain structure in these kids' brains. We've also looked at prenatal anxiety and here we were looking at functional connectivity. So higher anxiety was associated with weaker functional connectivity between the amygdala and areas of the postcentral gyrus here. And anxiety often co-occurs with depression, but it's, it's not the same thing. And so they do, um, they can have distinct effects on the brain. And that's what we're showing here is some of the effects of anxiety over and above the effects of depression. Now, importantly, I think we're actually able to connect these brain alterations to behavior problems. So we see that this white matter tract connecting the amygdala to prefrontal cortex actually mediates the association between prenatal depression symptoms and child behavior. Okay. So um, higher depression symptoms were associated with worse behavior in the kids and that was mediated by mean diffusivity in this white matter pathway. But now it's important to note that all of this work I have shown so far was actually done in women who largely did not have depression or anxiety problems. We're talking about a range of symptoms that's generally considered normal in pregnancy and that wouldn't be flagged as a substantial problem. So I think that's interesting for a couple of reasons. First is that it, these, are, these wouldn't be flagged as problems and we're still seeing the association. So it's suggesting this really um, broad relationship between symptoms and child outcomes, okay? Not just in women with clinical levels of symptoms. But it's also, uh, you know, sort of interesting because it represents a relatively limited group of women. So we were, here we were, um, you can see the year here, 2020, thinking about this and thinking about how to get at a sample that was more affected by prenatal distress and how to, how to really study that across a broader range of individuals. <clears throat> and then along came the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course has massively disrupted everybody's life pretty much, but it's had an especially large effect on pregnant individuals. So they've had altered healthcare. In many cases, appointments have been canceled. Some of them have to give birth without a partner or support person there. Um, also, women were more affected in terms of work changes or, or losing their jobs during the pandemic. And women who are pregnant are more likely to have other young children at home. And we know that there were big disruptions to childcare and to school. So they have they're more likely to have disruptions than the rest of us were. And on top of this, pregnancy and the transition to parenthood is really a time when people rely quite heavily on support from those around them, both in terms of social support, like practical support and social support. And obviously the pandemic has reduced people's ability to get that support from their family and friends. And so all of this has led to elevated stress in pregnancy during the pandemic. And this has obviously has effects on the pregnant individuals themselves, but it's also really likely to have a lasting impact on their children. And so this is what we were interested in looking at. <clears throat> 
So in early April, 2020, we launched this pregnancy during the pandemic study. <clears throat> and it's a Canada-wide study that was initially just a, an online intake survey. So we had over 11,000 people complete the survey. And I'm just showing you the demographics here. So pretty representative in terms of population across Canada, but as you'd expect with a survey where we weren't able to reimburse people or, or widely recruit, it was just online. They're um, a little bit, have a little bit higher income, a little bit more likely to be married and slightly higher uh, education levels than the general population. So to date, we've recorded about 6,000 deliveries in these women. So we're continuing to follow those babies. And the study overall, what it looks like is there's this initial survey at enrollment where we measured depression and anxiety symptoms. We asked a lot about life changes. So things like changes to work and whether they were infected with COVID, whether they had school changes for their other kids, those kinds of things. And then we asked about some of the factors we, we know or hypothesize to be protective, like social support and sleep. People completed monthly or bi-monthly survey follow-ups during pregnancy, and also subsets were asked to provide um, hair and stool samples. When kids are born, we get a quick survey of birth outcomes, so weight, gestational age of birth, those types of things. But then at three, six, 12, and now 24 months, they complete, families complete more extensive surveys about infant growth and development, child behavior, maternal health, kids' milestones, those kinds of things. And again, we have subsets providing biological samples, so hair and stool. And we're also getting blood spots in some of the women to confirm prior COVID infections. And then of great interest to me is the brain imaging. So at three and 12 months, we are now doing brain imaging in these kids to look at brain changes related to that prenatal stress. So as I said, um, pregnant people have really had substantially elevated stress. And this is backed up by our data and now by a number of other studies around the world. So here in blue, are the rates of clinically elevated symptoms of anxiety and depression in our sample. So almost half of the women in our sample are reporting clinically elevated anxiety and about a third of them are reporting clinically elevated depression. This is compared to normally about 20% of pregnant individuals and about 10% of, sorry, pregnant individuals report anxiety and about 10% report depression. And this is the US population norms, which are just slightly lower. So we're looking at rates that are double or triple what we would normally see prior to the pandemic. <clears throat> on, a, on a more positive note, we know there are some protective factors and I've mentioned social support a couple of times and we do see that in our data. So here, this is a measure of social support, generally from a partner, but it could be from another key person in the pregnant individual's life. And the more and the more effective social support that somebody reported they received, the lower their symptoms of prenatal distress. This is a composite of anxiety and depression. So we do see that social support is sort of helping out some of these individuals to feel less distressed. So I mentioned that we've done imaging on a, on a subset of these kids and we've now imaged about 75 infants in Calgary at three months of age. And we were interested in looking at associations between that prenatal stress that they experienced and their brain connectivity. So first we looked at structural connectivity and we looked at the unsnip fasciculus and another tract between the amygdala and the prefrontal lobe. So these are tracts we know are involved in mental health and those behaviors that we've seen in other literature. So here, prenatal distress, this is again a composite of anxiety and depression, was associated with higher FA in the uncinate and lower MD in this other amygdala prefrontal tract. So very consistent with our prior findings where worse distress seems to be associated with a bit of a more mature pattern of brain structure in these kids. Okay. So concerning, of course, because we're seeing higher rates of distress, which means we're also seeing higher rates of um, brain alterations. And then we looked at 
uh, functional connectivity, okay? And this is really interesting because we also saw similar findings to prior data, but here we actually saw moderation by social support, which is super interesting. So higher maternal distress was associated with weaker functional connectivity between the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. But predominantly in individuals with low social support, okay? So if you have high distress, but you also had high social support, it seems like your infant's brain is a little bit protected. Whereas it's the women with high distress and lower social support whose infants had the most atypical brain. So to not, not only do we see this social support as positive for women, but it also seems like it helps to somewhat disrupt the transmission of that stress to their baby's brains. We also see a moderation by infant sleep, um, which is maybe depressing to those of us whose kids didn't sleep as infants, but encouraging if you, if you can get your kids to sleep. Um, so here, higher prenatal depression symptoms were associated with reduced brain efficiency in these infants, but only in infants who had a lower total amount of sleep. The infants who were getting more sleep didn't have this association between their mom's depression symptoms and their brain efficiency. So a couple of interesting moderating factors here, right, that appear to change that relationship between prenatal distress and infant brain outcomes. Okay, so to wrap everything up, um, I've shown you prenatal alcohol exposure and how it's associated with different structural and functional brain metrics, as well as altered brain development, particularly in these young kids with alcohol exposure, and how PAE also disrupts the relationships between brain and mental health. We talked about how prenatal distress, so anxiety and depression, are associated with altered brain connectivity and how this is linked to behavior in children and also how it's moderated by um, some of the other factors. I think, you know, to sum up some of the key points here, one of the really important things I want people to keep in mind is that multiple exposures are really common and it's important to recognize this, to distinguish it when you can, but we can't always do that, but it's important to at least recognize that we're probably not capturing the whole picture. And that longitudinal data is really critical for understanding this brain development piece, which can help explain sometimes apparently discrepant findings across age groups. And so with that, I want to thank my wonderful lab who did so much of the work I have shown you today, um, our collaborators on this, these studies, our funding sources, and of course I wanna thank you for your attention today. Thank you so much, Dr. LaBelle, for a wonderful talk. Um, I believe we have some time for questions. Uh, so I'm just going to look for people's hands up. Uh, Dr. King. Yeah, hi, Catherine. Really great to hi, talk. And what a wonderful um, body of work. I'm I, I can't say enough how impressed I am with your um, COVID study, especially getting it started um, already in April of 2020. Um, but looking at your, your other uh, longitudinal data with fetal alcohol exposure, um, have, you, have you thought about doing anything that might be cross-lagged over time? Because wondering about the possibility that what's happening in the brain might influence what's happening in behavior. So for example, looking at um, externalizing problems at one age, predicting um, brain at the next age, which predicts externalizing at the next age. Is there any idea or am I, is this way out in uh, left field or right field, the idea no. that, um, that what's happening in the brain could then influence um, behavior. It seems like it would be, or and also the behavior would influence the brain. Totally, you have um, serendipitously just described the project we're currently working on. So we don't have data that we've analyzed yet, but we're currently collecting 
data in a longitudinal study where we measure brain and behavior at baseline. One year later, we do a quick check-in on behavior. And then another year later, we measure brain and behavior again. And that's exactly what we're, we're trying to get at is what you're describing is do these sort of influence each other? How do they do it? Can we can we predict at baseline who's going to go on to have a mental health problem or whose who's problems are going to get better or worse, those kinds of ideas. Um, and I think, I think you're right that it can go both ways. Brain can be, predict behavior. Behavior may also help us understand how the brain is going to develop. So we haven't done that yet, but we're, we're trying to do that. Well, I'm looking forward to those results. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, um, Dr. Chakravarti. Thanks, Kelly. Um, what an amazing talk and what an incredible breadth of different studies and uh, echoes and sentiments. It's pretty impressive that you were able to get that COVID study up and running in April of 2020. <laughs> Almost, uh, it's like you knew we were gonna be in this two years later or something. We, uh, we shut down recruitment thinking it would be over. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about that part. Um, no. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all that optimism. Um, uh, but I was really intrigued because actually Lonnie and I were having a discussion kind of offline between um, between this, the morning session and this afternoon session about kind of, you know, we've been talking about second hits in terms of their their influence on mental health or, or mental health outcomes in, in these kids. Uh, but certainly this is an interesting thing looking at things that would be protective in some way, right? So social support, uh, sleep. Um, because I, I know my son didn't sleep, you know, properly for two and a half years. Uh, <laughs> he's okay now, but just in case anyone was curious. Um, I've been there. <laughs> I, I figured as much given the way you you couch yeah. that. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm curious as to you know the other constellation of variables like SES or um, you know maternal paternal education, uh, you know education, household education in general, and then kind of the interplay with the, the specific demographics, because, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, you're, not all Canadians are, are have the median income of a thousand, hundred thousand, yeah. six-figure salaries, right? So, you know, I, I know that's a big question, but I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, and I think it's, it's particularly relevant during the pandemic, right? Because we know that people have been disproportionately affected um, in different groups, diff particularly different SES groups, different um, occupational groups and, and education groups as well. And so it's, I think it's really important. Um, I know, as I, as I said, with the PA data, we're not capturing the whole picture, right? So we do try to control for some of those SES variables. We control for maternal education, tends to be the one we usually use. Um, in our, in our analysis there, but we're currently sort of sorting through that data in the pregnancy period to look at how it's associated with the mental health. And then I think what we're gonna try to do is pick out the variables that are most closely linked with the, the mental health in these women and pick those to put into some of the brain analyses. Cause we can't, we can't control for everything. Of course, it just gets too unwieldy and, and we lose all of our effects. But I think it's a really, really important point and there's that um prenatal and it's different postnatal right so um for example our pae kids have often changing ses um, when they go into foster care or adoptive care right. and so thinking about how changes in those types of ses variables might also influence brain development okay. um, so it's a complicated it's a really complicated picture yeah. but you know we're trying to trying to focus in on as much as we can Thanks so much, and, and thanks for for bookending this uh, this whole conference. <laughs> Thank you, um, Lanny. Thanks. Yeah, I guess I'll take the the liberty of asking the last question as we move into our last uh, section of the conference. Um, but I was curious, uh, more of a basic understanding question: if um, when you see depressive symptoms uh, prenatally in women, if that's more often associated with postpartum depression as well, and then how that can impact um, what you might see in the, in the longer term results. Yeah, so prenatal symptoms are definitely predictive of postnatal symptoms, but they don't always, right? So there are different trajectories and there are some women that um, have symptoms largely resolved postnatally and some women who develop 
new symptoms postnatally. So um, we are trying in some other work to look at some of those trajectories of symptoms across pregnancy and postnatally and how that's associated with the brains as well. Um, like everything, it's, it's sort of a complicated analysis with lots of different pieces to it. Um, but yes, they're correlated, but but not perfectly. Um, so in many of our analyses, we will control. We'll run the analysis on prenatal and we'll control for postpartum symptoms. Yeah. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you for being our oh, final thanks. keynote of the conference. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all so much again for uh, your attention and participation.